I'd like to welcome you to the assembly this morning. We're happy to be here, happy to have each and every one present here with us. We welcome you uh, to our assembly this morning. If you're visiting here with us, we're really happy to have you as well and thankful for this opportunity to have you join us in our time of worship this morning. We're going to be continuing our series this morning on the subject of the story of the New Testament. And uh, so this morning we come to the second part of our series together. And as we begin to take a look at this particular time, uh, we are uh, beginning to talk about what we're going to call this morning the expansion. And so Jesus, uh, in the beginning of the book of Acts, following his resurrection, Jesus returns to heaven. So he was on earth 40 days after his resurrection, then he returned to heaven. And he leaves behind these leaders, these men called the apostles. Apostles are his official spokesmen, his official witnesses. And from that time till today, what happened is we have these 27 books called the New Testament. So how did that happen? That's kind of the point of this series. How did those books come to be? Why were they written? When were they written? And what's the kind of the backstory behind the writing of the books of the New Testament? And so kind of the foundational backstory happens in the first seven chapters of the book of Acts, where you see this pattern develop, where, you know, this these kind of problems, challenges, opportunities develop and they come to the apostles and the apostles have the answer. And that happens over and over again throughout these first several chapters. Eventually, it's not just the apostles, but there are these men around them called prophets and they also begin to take part in offering direction and guidance about how to follow Jesus. And they were able to do all of this because these apostles and prophets are inspired by God. They're inspired by the Holy Spirit. So they're offering this guidance. Now in those first seven chapters, zero books of the New Testament are written. So no, none of the books that you read in the New Testament are written within the first seven chapters of the book of Acts. What we're going to study this what morning we're going to study is the beginning of the writing of the New Testament. And this happens because in Acts chapter 8, the church is scattered. And that's all, this is all in accordance with the plan of Jesus Christ. So here's what I'd like to do this morning to begin, is to read with you just one passage from the book of Acts to show what Jesus told the apostles is going to happen. In Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, um, he's telling them uh, to wait in Jerusalem. He's getting ready to go back to heaven. He says, you just wait. And you're going to be able to know what to do. When it talks about power in this passage, it's talking the, about, you know, the, the Holy Spirit coming upon them, which is kind of clear here in this passage. But they're directed by the Holy Spirit miraculously. Here's what it says in Acts 1 and 8. You shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. Now here's what they're going to do. You shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. So that's what's going to happen in the book of Acts, is these apostles are going to be witnesses, and they're going to do that starting in Jerusalem, and they're going to go to Judea and Samaria, which are the broader areas, kind of just right there around Jerusalem, and then they're going to go to the ends of the earth, which is, means throughout the Roman Empire. Okay, so that's Acts chapter 1 and verse 8. As they do so, remember this foundational slide here. This is kind of the foundation of the whole thing. In John 14 and John 16, those two passages up there, that's Jesus promising the apostles before he ever died that they would be guided by the Holy Spirit. We also learn in, that, in 2 Timothy 3 and in 2 Peter chapter 1 that that is the way all Scripture came into existence, was through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. So the apostles are going to be guided by that. That's how all Scripture comes to be. And beginning very, very early in the process, the books of the New Testament begin being called Scripture. So for example, in 1 Timothy 5 and verse 8, Paul refers to a passage from the book of Luke and calls it Scripture. 
Or in 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 15 and 16, Peter references the writings of Paul and calls them Scripture. And what ultimately happens is they're writing Scripture in Ephesians 2 and in 1 Corinthians 3 there, is the apostles and prophets are laying the foundation for the church. And using the writings of Scripture, then in 1 Timothy 3 and 15, we know how we're supposed to conduct ourselves as members of God's family. So that's why the story of the New Testament is important, and that's why as we begin looking at it today, we're going to start seeing how the books came to be. So in Acts chapter 8, the very first part of Acts chapter 8, we find a significant change taking place. If you have your Bibles, we're going to kind of be cruising through quite a few... uh, um, cha- chapters in the book of Acts this morning. This is chapters in the book so of Acts this morning. This is survey material, so we're not going to be doing deep dives into any of these passages. But if you have a Bible and you open it up, you'll be able to kind of cruise with me here through the book of Acts. In Acts chapter 8, the first three verses, or four verses, uh, the Bible talks about the growth of the persecution against the church after this prophet named Stephen dies. And Stephen's buried, and then in verse 3, as for Saul, this is Saul of Tarsus, he made havoc of the church, entering every house and dragging off men and women and committing them to prison. Therefore, those who were scattered went everywhere, preaching the word. Verse 8 also mentions that idea that everybody scattered except the apostles, so they all leave Jerusalem. And as they leave Jerusalem now, the message is going to expand. And what we're going to find in this particular period of time, um, this takes us to about the 15th birthday of the church by the time you get to the end of this slide right here, chronologically. For the first 10 years or so of the church, 10 to 15 years of the church, this pattern of you know, problems coming to the apostles, that continues. But the way they deal with it, everybody's not in Jerusalem anymore. So how do they deal with it? Well, the apostles travel to these different areas. And as they travel to these areas, they begin to kind of engage in these different problems and opportunities, providing that inspired guidance. So we begin in Acts chapter 8, as the church is scattered here. Starting in verse 5, Luke follows the story of this preacher named Philip. And Philip, he goes, it says, down to Samaria. Samaria is actually north of Jerusalem, um, but it's down in elevation. It's at a lower elevation. Anyway, he goes up to Samaria and he preaches there, and it's very, very successful. Lots of people are baptized. Notice what happens in Acts 8 and verse 14. When the apostles who were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria received the word, they sent Peter and John to them, who when they had come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. For as yet he had fallen upon none of them. They had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And they laid hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. And Simon, Simon the sorcerer, saw that through the laying on of the apostles' hands the Holy Spirit was given. He offered them money. So the apostles go to Samaria. And they go there to lay hands on them to receive the Holy Spirit. They don't have the New Testament. So the only way for the church to continue was through the the miraculous abilities that the Holy Spirit could give. That the apostles had to be there. They're there in person. This continues in chapter 9. In Acts chapter 9, as you continue there in Acts chapter 9, you learn of the conversion of Saul of Tarsus in the beginning of Acts chapter 9. But one particular verse I want to share with you here is in Acts chapter 9, uh, verse 32 I want you to just notice this trend of traveling continues. Look at what it says here about Peter. Now it came to pass as Peter went through all parts of the country, that he also came down to the saints who dwelt at Lydda. So Peter's just going around everywhere. He's going through all parts of the country. Peter the apostle, he's traveling everywhere. And that brings us now to chapter 10. In chapter 10, you end up with this... New opportunity. Chapter 10 is about 10 years after the birth of the church. And you have this man named Cornelius who's praying. And then you have Peter who has this vision. 
And what happens is God brings them together. Why does he do that? Who is Cornelius? Well, the first 10 years of the church, every single person who became part of the church was Jewish. They were either like born and raised that way or they became Jewish. They're called proselytes. But beginning in Acts 10, that's all going to change. Now Gentiles are going to be able to become part of the church. And Cornelius and his household are technically speaking, they're Gentiles. And so how's this change going to come about? How's this opportunity going to happen? Well, God puts Peter right in the middle of it. Peter the Apostle. And what does Peter do? Peter gets invited to their house. He takes this group of guys with him. And they go into this house. And things happen with Cornelius that lead Peter to understand what God's will is. God's will is for the door now to be open for the Gentiles too. And Gentiles don't have to become Jews to become Christians. They just become Christians. So what happens at the end of Acts 10? While Peter was still speaking these words, this verse 44... The Holy Spirit fell upon all those who heard the word, and those of the circumcision who believed were astonished, as many as came with Peter, because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles also. And they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Then Peter answered, Can anyone forbid water that these should not be baptized to receive the Holy Spirit? He commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord, and they asked him to stay a few days. So we're not going to walk through all the details of this. The main point we're making here is the apostles needed to be present. They're there. There's Peter, and what is Peter doing? He's commanding people. He's telling them exactly what needs to happen. And he's not making it up. He is guided by the Holy Spirit. But he had to be there. Now this conversion is controversial. So what does Peter do? He makes another trip. You get tired following Peter, right? He's going everywhere. In Acts 11, he goes back to Jerusalem. And once he's back in Jerusalem, they have this discussion about the conversion of Gentiles, and they all begin to understand the door's been opened to the Gentiles. From Jerusalem, the gospel spreads into this particular region. And it does it. As it does so, the apostles go and they visit themselves into all these different areas. Okay, now another thing begins now to happen in Acts 11. This new church is established in Antioch. And in Antioch, there's Jew and Gentile together. And beginning in Acts 13, they send out this guy named Paul and his partner Barnabas. And in Acts 13 and 14, they take the first missionary journey. Okay, so the apostles are journeying throughout Judea and Samaria. Now it's getting ready to grow. And as it grows in Acts 13 and 14 through this first missionary journey, now all these new churches are established. And you just think of the volume of work required. It just begins to grow and grow and grow, just like a fire. And it's spreading everywhere. It's gone beyond Judea and Samaria now to this region these regions in Acts 13 and 14. And as the gospel spreads, this challenge of apostles being present to deal with problems becomes harder and harder and harder to maintain. And that strategy, they begin to be stretched, and they're stretched more and more and more and more. And so what's going to happen? What's going to happen? So now we come to Acts 15. And in Acts 15, a problem develops. A problem develops. The problem is, as the gospel's going into these different regions now, what is the right way to put together the Old Testament and the New Testament? What is required from the Old Testament for Christians? And our Christians bound, obligated to keep any part of the Old Testament. Well, some of the Christians sure thought so, and they're preaching that. And so some of them came to the city of Antioch, where the Apostle Paul was, and they were preaching that, and he argued with them. He withstood them to their face. 
Well, they argued right back and they never gave. So they end up in Jerusalem. That's Acts 15. And when they go back to Jerusalem, this is titled lots of different things, the Jerusalem Council or whatever. It's not a council, it's just a meeting. And Paul didn't go back to Jerusalem to figure out what the truth was. Paul knew the truth. He went back to figure out, are you guys sending out preachers to teach this stuff? And if you are, let me tell you, you're wrong. That was kind of his thing. So he, he, is an author, he is an authoritative source of truth. He's an inspired apostle. Anyway, so they get back here in Acts 15, and here's all these folks, lots of different ones there that are together. I'm not going to walk through all those details, but what I want to show you is one change that happens in Acts 15 that becomes extremely important. In Acts 15, starting in verse 22, here's what I want you to see. Um, as they've kind of talked it all through in verses 6 through 21, they've recognized that the Old Testament isn't for Christians as far as teaching us binding law and all that stuff. But here's what they say in Acts 15 and 22. It pleased the apostles and elders with the whole church to send chosen men of their own company to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas, namely Judas, who was named Barsabbas, and Silas, the leading, uh, leading men among the brethren. And they wrote this letter by them. So for the first time to solve a problem, what do they do? They write a letter. There's the first one. That's the first time that happens. And they write this letter and they send it out. And it has a pretty general audience. It's supposed to go to a lot of different places. And throughout the beginning of Acts 16, it's delivered all over the place. Why was this letter from these guys important? If you look at Acts 15 and 28, it says it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us. So this is an inspired letter. And for the first time, an inspired letter is sent throughout the churches. So it begins to develop this new strategy. We can't be everywhere to deal with all of these problems. So what do we need to do? We need to write a letter. And let's send this letter. And this letter can be sent all over the place. And there are two men that are in this audience in Acts 15 that are part of this discussion, that are central to the discussion in Acts 15, that begin to make note of that, and they immediately make a very similar application. And these two men are Paul and a man named James. James is the brother of Jesus. He's his physical brother. And James is uh, kind of known throughout the New Testament. I'm not going to go through all of his biography or whatever. He's kind of an important guy. Very likely, James is an elder in the church at Jerusalem. And so right after Acts 15, what does James do? James sits down and writes the book of James. Chronologically speaking, James is probably the very first book written in the New Testament. And he writes in James chapter 1 and verse 1, to the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad. He writes to Jewish Christians. And what does James write to them? James writes to them this book that challenges them to live their faith. And if you think you're living your faith, let me write to you some things that will challenge you and help you examine yourself, and you can see if you really are or not. And where are these Jewish Christians living? They're scattered everywhere. So this is a very universal message for this particular group of people that are struggling to live their faith in the world in which they find themselves. So right after Acts 15, when the Church of Jerusalem sends out that letter, now James writes the very first book of the New Testament and sends it to the tw to tribes, these Jewish people scattered everywhere. Similarly, Another man who was there is the Apostle Paul. And around this time, he begins hearing about these problems in Galatia. And Galatia is not a city. Galatia is a region. And this particular region is a region that where he had visited on his very first missionary journey. So it hadn't been very long that he, ago that he had actually been in that region and had been with them. And what happens in Galatia is very similar to what happens in Acts 15. They're having this discussion within their number, within their, the churches of that particular region. 
about the part the Old Testament is supposed to play in the life of the church. And when Paul writes to them, he says in Galatians 1 and verse 6, I marvel that you're turning away so soon from him who called you in the grace of Christ to a different gospel, which is not another. But there are some who trouble you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. So he's shocked that this has happened so quickly. You're already leaving. And this isn't a gospel. What they're teaching is not a gospel. There's nothing about it that you should be clinging to. And so he writes the book of Galatians. And Galatians kind of has, you know, three main points. The first main point in the first two chapters is him discussing his own credibility as an apostle. Chapters 3 and 4 really talks about kind of the nuts and bolts of the gospel that he preaches. And chapters 5 and 6 talks about kind of the, the life, the application of that gospel. So there's the book of Galatians written to deal with this problem. The first two books of the New Testament have now been written right around 50 AD is where we are. Maybe just a little bit before that is when James and Galatians are likely written. There's the first two books of the New Testament. Now following this meeting in Jerusalem, these two books have now been written. Paul says, I'm going to go and I'm going to go visit these churches again. He ends up with a different partner this time, a man named Silas. And uh, they continue on this strategy of these missionary journeys. And so from Antioch, they'd kind of leave and they'd go all over the place. The first missionary journey covers kind of a smaller region. The second missionary journey gets bigger, and it gets bigger by God's leading. As you begin to read Acts chapter 16, you know, they had this idea of where they were going to go. And it's interesting. You read the first part of Acts 16, the Holy Spirit kind of kept telling them, no, don't go there. Don't go there. Don't go there. Don't go there. And kind of directs them to this area where they're kind of at a dead end. They're at the end of the road. The only thing in front of them is water. And Paul has this dream of a man of Macedonia calling them over. And so for the first time in Acts 16, the gospel goes to Europe. It goes north to Europe. And he ends up in Acts 16 in the city of Philippi. And so he spends a, some time there in Philippi. And uh, he's, as he says elsewhere, spitefully treated in Philippi. They're not very hospitable to him. He ends up spending some time in jail there. He gets out, but he leaves behind a very good congregation. He eventually makes his way then to Thessalonica. And uh, someone recently mentioned the idea of a free city. Thessalonica is also a free city. What that means is like these appeals to Caesar and stuff like that, those didn't matter in free cities. Free cities could do whatever they wanted to to punish people. So it's a very dangerous place in a way for a man like Saul to be. So when he ends up in Thessalonica and they persecute him, he ends up leaving quickly from Thessalonica in the beginning of Acts 17. Goes from Thessalonica to Berea, he's persecuted there, and so he finally ends up in Athens by himself. And it's just trying to let the dust settle a little bit. At the end of Acts 17, the dust finally settles, and now they make their way to Corinth in Acts 18. Paul's time in Corinth is in the very beginning of the 50s, like 51, 52 A.D., somewhere in there. According to Acts 18, if you read verses 9 through about 11, I think, uh, Jesus has a conversation with Paul while he's in Corinth. And he basically tells him, stay here. I've got people for you to reach. And so Paul stays in Corinth for a year and a half. He'd been chased. He had a hard time in Philippi, got chased out of Thessalonica, got chased out of Berea. Didn't have a lot of success in Athens. Jesus says, you camp out here in Corinth. So while he is doing that, this is the second missionary journey here. He gets information from Thessalonica. And the report comes from Timothy. In 1 Thessalonians 3, one of the preachers that traveled with Paul a lot brings him this report about Thessalonica. They've kind of got two problems they're dealing with in Thessalonica. Problem number one is the problem of persecution. Paul's dealt with that there too. He knows all about that. 
And so when you read the beginning of the book of of 1 Thessalonians, you kind of read about how to think about this persecution and how that persecution has not prevented them from being successful. But then he begins to deal with a second problem, and that is false teaching. And those two things tend to go together. And so the false teaching in particular has to do with the end of time. And what will happen to people who have already died at the end of time? And so in the very end of chapter 4, in the beginning of chapter 5, he deals with that particular subject. There's the book of 1 Thessalonians. Word comes back, there's continuing to be some challenges around these two issues. And so he writes 2 Thessalonians. And in 2 Thessalonians, he's even more blunt about the persecution, especially in chapter 1, and about the ultimate end of those who are persecuting the church and the end of those who are faithful to the Lord. But then he begins to deal with this second issue of false teaching. And in chapters 2 and 3, he deals with two different components of the false teaching, continuing false teaching about the end of time, and kind of the con- one of the consequential things about it, one of the consequences of this false teaching, some people had just quit working because of this false teaching. And so it's in 2 Thessalonians 3, he says, hey, if, if you won't work, you shouldn't eat. If you want to eat, you should work. That's the plan of the Lord. So that's 2 Thessalonians 3. These two books are written within a short period of time. There's not a lot of time in between these two. Now he leaves... Corinth in Acts 18 and he makes his way quickly through Ephesus they want him to stay longer but he doesn't and so now he makes his way back to Antioch again in Acts 18 and 22 he's not there very long before he starts the third missionary journey and in Acts 18 and 23 here he goes on his third missionary journey and he ends up in the city of Ephesus And this is where, as far as we know, where he spends the longest period of time with one group of people. He's in Ephesus about three years. And it is during his time in Ephesus that he receives all this information from Corinth. And in 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 10, these people from the household of Chloe, they show up with a report about problems in the church at Corinth. And so Paul sits down and writes the book of 1 Corinthians. Going from Corinth, he ends up in Macedonia, and he gets this other report from Titus this time, and now he writes the book of 2 Corinthians. It's interesting, right? Paul is a busy guy. He's running all the time, but every once in a while, he has to sit down and stay somewhere for a while. And when he does that, information makes its way to him, and he writes a book. He writes a book. So by the time this, sec- this third missionary journey ends, he's written 1st and 2nd Corinthians. Now he's on his way to Jerusalem for three months. In Acts 20, verses 2 and 3, he sa- is in the area again of Greece. He's basically in Corinth. So he's actually been able to come and make this visit that he wanted to make to them after writing these two books. And while he's there, he writes the book of Romans. And what is the book of Romans about? You know, the book of Romans is not really a book written about a problem. It kind of feels that way the first time you read it. It feels like it's corrective, like Galatians is or something, but it really actually isn't. Here's the idea behind Romans. And you learn this really by reading Romans chapter 15. What Paul wanted is he wanted to travel to Rome And he wanted the church at Rome then to send him to Spain. And what does he want? He wants basically the church at Rome to become his new Antioch. And instead of coming and going from Antioch, he wants to come and go from Rome. And in a sense, the book of Romans is kind of like his tryout. (laughs) Like, here's the gospel I preach. And if you send me, this is what I'm going to preach. So that's the aim of the book of Romans. And Romans is really about opportunities. Here's how we can capitalize on the opportunities that are available all over the world. 
And so by the end of the third missionary journey, he's now also written the book of Romans. So that gets us to Acts 20. And next time we'll talk in more detail about what goes on next with Paul. In Acts 20, he's going to end up getting arrested and all of that. We'll talk about that as we talk about the 60s. But through this decade of the 50s, you know, all of Paul's activity, he's written all of these books. Other books have been written as well. And dating these books is actually really hard. Um, there are a couple of different things. I'm not going to run through these, any of these details, actually. But there are a couple of little things that help us know. These books are written for sure before the destruction of Jerusalem, which happened in 70 A.D., but they're likely written earlier than that. The book of Acts ends with Paul in prison in Rome, and that ends in 62 A.D. So the book of Acts and the book of Luke are both written before that point. Anyway, somewhere in that decade, these four books are also written. And what's interesting about it is as this Disciples have scattered now. They're going everywhere. They're trying to figure out how to live the life. One of the things God does is He reminds them about Jesus. You want to know what to do? Here's how you do it. You follow Jesus. And so here comes the Gospel of Matthew. Matthew's an apostle. And he writes... He's a, a Jewish guy, obviously, all 12 of the apostles obviously are, but he writes to a Jewish audience. It's a very Jewish book. And so it appears to be written to Jewish Christians. Mark is different. Mark appears to have been written to people who really are more familiar with Latin than they are Greek, for instance, and so more of a Roman audience, maybe less of a Jewish audience. He explains kind of Jewish customs to his audience. So here comes the Gospel of Mark up into this area of Rome. Mark, by the way, is very closely associated with the Apostle Peter. And historically speaking, people used to talk about Mark as kind of Peter's Gospel, in a way. Not that Peter wrote it, but that Mark was so close to him, it was like reading Peter's Gospel. Uh, Luke is very close to the Apostle Paul. And Luke writes his Gospel to a guy named Theophilus. And both Luke and Acts are written to him. And perhaps this is like a wealthy man that financed the writing of these two books. I don't know. But Luke is a doctor. He investigates the history of the life of Jesus and the history of the church. And he writes it down. He is close to Paul. He spends time with Paul in the book of Acts. And he is also inspired. And so he writes these books. What I want you to see is they're written to all these different audiences but the stories they tell perfectly harmonize. And so what it shows is whatever our circumstance, we're all following the same Lord, Jesus Christ. So by the time you get to about 60 AD, you now have, that's 11, I think. That's 11 books, if I'm remembering my count right. And there's five different authors. There's 27 books in the New Testament. 11 of them are written by 60 A.D. And God used five different guys to do that. Only five. Only five. There's a lot of good people. There's a lot of inspired people, but lot, they didn't all write books. God's very selective on how that happens. And what are these books basically telling people? Wherever you are, Keep living with Jesus as your Lord. Whatever your circumstance, keep following Him. And whatever pressure comes along, don't let it pull you away from Him. Stay close to Him. Keep following Him wherever you go. There's the message that really comes through in those first 11 books of the New Testament. As we consider this particular section here, these 11 books are written in harmony with this point that we made at the very beginning. These are inspired books. That means they're books given from God Himself. And these inspired books are Scripture that continue to guide the church all these years later. And so there's the story of what happened as it expands. As it expands, the strategy of the apostles being there in person, 
to deal with all these problems, they eventually just get stretched too thin where that strategy won't work anymore. And so this new strategy given from God begins to develop. Write a letter. Write a letter. So the church of Jerusalem's inspired. They write this letter. And then here comes James and Galatians, and then there's the rest of the story. They begin writing letters. And before you know it, we've got 11 books by five different guys 30 years after the birth of the church. There's our study for this morning. Next time, we're going to talk about the development of some more books because as many challenges as the church has faced, we now enter the decade of the 60s. And in our history, the 1960s was kind of a crazy decade in the United States, but back in the first century, the 60s was also a crazy decade. In other words, lots of strange and difficult things happened that the church had to face. And against that backdrop, several more of the books of the New Testament are going to be written. So we'll study that next time that we have the opportunity. If you're here this morning and you've never yet obeyed the gospel, this New Testament that we've been given provides us direction for how to become a Christian. We learn how to obey the gospel from reading the New Testament, in other words. And so we learn in Acts chapter, or excuse me, Romans chapter 10, that the whole process begins by hearing the gospel preached and making the decision to believe in Jesus Christ, to repent of your sins, to confess your faith, and to be immersed in water for the forgiveness of sins. This is God's plan of salvation. If you've obeyed the gospel before, but you have faltered and need to make correction of a public nature, we hope that you'll do that. One of you the case, please come while we stand and while we sing.